Hello there. Welcome back for another Network Plus video. This time we're looking at routing basics. We're going to have a look at how routers think, how they work, and how they make decisions on falling traffic. We're also going to have a look at some static routing, which is quite easy to talk about as it's all manually configured and very straightforward. Let's get into it. Routers exist for one key thing, inter subnet communications and they are going to facilitate traffic forwarding to destination subnets. Pretty straightforward. Now, a router will make a selection based on the following two key things. First of all, that it knows the network address that it finds in the destination IP address field of a packet. And the second thing it needs is also the network address being present in the router's routing table. Once it has those two things, routers can make a selection and decide how to forward traffic. Now one of the key things to remember is that a router only needs to know enough to get the traffic to the next router. They're kind of lazy. Once they've made a decision to forward a packet, they're not really bothered about keeping track of what happens. They just care about getting the packet to the next step, or as we say in routing, the next hop. Now everything revolves around the routing table. So let's check out what's in the routing table and what information is necessary. Now, obviously, the different network vendors routing tables will have varying information, but usually there will be three key things that needs to be in the routing table so that a router can select that route for forwarding a packet to an appropriate destination. And that first and most obvious one will be the destination network address and preferably the subnet mask so that the router can cope with IP subnets that have been subnetted. The router will also need to keep track of the outbound interface. Now this will be for the router in question. When we're looking at a router, it looks at, okay, am I sending this out of interface number one, interface number two, interface number whatever. And then it will also want to keep track of the next hop or the next router's IP address. So that'll be the IP of the next router. Having these three key things in the routing table, a router will be able to successfully use this route anytime a packet has that given destination network address as its destination IP. Any additional information will be giving you extra information and insight into how the router decided to use this particular route for this given destination. Now, let's have a look at this in action. So let's have a network. We're going to have a network of 10.1.1.0/24 and a network of 192.168.1.0 with a 24-bit mask. And we're going to look at what would that router need to know to be able to plot a route to that 192.168.1.0 network. Well, first of all, it's going to need to keep track of its interfaces. So let's call these two interfaces Gigabit Ethernet 0. Gigabit Ethernet 1 and Gigabit Ethernet 2. Then it needs to keep track of next hop information. So let's say the next router that is on the way to the 192.168.1 network is the 172.1601 for the router on the way to 192.168.1.0 and the other router is 172.1701 with a 16-bit mask. Now if we give it a routing table, this is what we're going to be basically caring about. Now, obviously, when we look at different vendors in networking, their routing tables are going to contain different information and be formatted a bit differently. But the three key pieces of information will almost always be there. And those three things are the destination network that we're interested in, the outbound interface of the current router, so Gig Ethernet 1, is for describing this router's exit interface when it's forwarding traffic to that destination. And then... It'll also keep track of the next router's IP address, 172.1601, and it might even keep track of the subnet mask for the next hop, although that's not necessarily needed, mainly because it'll treat that as a unicast address. It's not going to be worrying too much about the next router's subnet. So that information would successfully allow this router to be able to forward a packet to that network. Now, in terms of how we get these routing table entries, Let's check out how we populate a routing table. So there are three main methods. The first one is the destination network is directly connected. 
which means that the router currently has an interface in that IP subnet. So for instance, this router on the right hand side here is connected to 192.168.1.0 and it's got an interface in there, 192.168.1.1 with a 24-bit mask. Now, because that router has a direct connection to that subnet, it will automatically add that subnet to its routing table. Generally, when directly connected networks are added to a routing table, there is no better method of learning a route generally. So it'll take preference over all other methods of learning a route. It'll also have a cost of zero because it costs that router nothing to get the traffic there. So again, no route could have a better cost compared to the router that's got a connection straight into that network. The second method is we could always do static routing, which we'll talk a bit about at the end of this video, where we're going to manually configure routes. Now, this is usually going to be used when the destination network is not directly connected to a router, and we want it to be able to get traffic to that network. There will be no cost calculated for a static route as nothing is being measured. The router is just blindly following our instructions as an administrator. Then the third option is a dynamic route being added to the routing table. This usually means the router learned this via a dynamic routing protocol, which we will discuss in the next video. Now when it comes to dynamic routing, cost does get factored in. Dynamic routing protocols will have a cost logic that's going to vary by protocol, but usually it's a measure that tries to appraise what that protocol thinks is the best overall route, and assigns a cost that is generally close to zero. Now these three methods of learning a route. Sometimes a router may be presented with multiple options on how to populate its routing table. And one of the ways it can make a decision about which route should it favor is something called route preference. Sometimes this might be known by other names like administrative distance. But generally, it is a score value that is going to be given to a route so that the router can decide, OK, I like this more than that method of learning a route. Now, there will be values that will be given to these, and those values will vary by vendor. But the rule of thumb with most vendors is generally the closer that preference or administrative distance score is to zero for a given method of learning a route, the more preferred that route will be and the more likely it will take its place in the routing table. So let's have an example of that. So here's a little table I put together using Cisco's administrative distance as a point of reference. And you'll see there that a directly connected route has a preference or distance of zero, meaning it is as close to zero as it can get. And then a static route gets an administrative distance or preference value of one making it only slightly worse than being directly connected. The idea is Cisco assumes that we know what we're doing when we're setting up a static route. Then we've got EIGRP, which used to be a Cisco proprietary protocol, but back in 2013 they've added an open standard, but very few vendors have adopted it. Nonetheless, though, it's a pretty interesting routing protocol that we'll have a chat about in the next video. And it gets an administrative distance of 90. Then you get OSPF or Open Shortest Path First, which gets a score of 110 with Cisco. And the Routing Information Protocol or RIP gets a score of 120. Now, as I said, though, these values might vary depending on the network vendor you're dealing with. So if you end up dealing with a network vendor other than Cisco, do a bit of homework, check what they use as a scoring system so that you can predict what routing protocol will possibly take place in the routing table and be preferred over another one. Now, assuming that you have two routes to the same destination network and that are both learned through the same method, that means it comes down to a cost difference that will decide what we use. So every route will have a cost value. Generally, with directly connected and static routes, they get a cost value of zero, and dynamic routes will have their costs calculated by the dynamic routing protocol. And as I said, when two or more routes exist to the same destination and the preferences are equal, costs can decide which is generally better. And again, closer to zero, the better. So in other words, the lower the cost, 
the more likely that route would become the more preferable option in the routing table. Now, let's move on to route selection for forwarding. When a router receives a packet, it will inspect the destination IP address and then start looking through its routing table. And what it's looking for is something called the longest matching entry. The idea of the longest matching entry is that the more of the destination IP address that a routing table entry matches, the more likely it will be used. So let's have a little example. Let's say we have a destination IP address of 172.16.2.1 and we have three likely routing table entries. The first routing table entry is 172.161.0 with a slash 24 mask. Routing table entry number two is 172.16.2.0 with a slash 24 mask as well. And then routing table entry number three is 172.16.0.0 with a slash 16 mask. So if we look through it, we can see that the first octets match. They're all 172. Okay, so far so good. All three routing table entries are pretty good for that destination IP address. Let's check. Well, the second octet is 16, so they all match. The third octet is probably where it's going to start getting a bit different. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have routing table entry number three dropping out because it's a slash 16 mask. So only the first two octets define the network address, while the first and second routing table entry there are slash 24 masks, so they're defined. But what we have is we've got a 172.16.2 and a 172.16.1. Destination IP address is 172.16.2.1. So, so far, routing table entry number two is matching a little bit better. But the router still goes and checks just to make sure that it hasn't got a routing table entry that defines all 32, which is a doable thing. And, well, for the fourth octet, none of them are matching. So it turns out that routing table entry number two is the one that matches the longest. And if that was the packet being processed right now, that is the routing table entry that would be favored. And then the router will go and check, well, what's the exit interface or next top IP address. So let's go check out what a routing table looks like. Now, obviously I keep warning you, there are multiple vendors and they all do it their own different way. So let's have three examples. First up, here's a routing table entry that we can go and check out. And it is coming from Cisco. Now, when you're on a Cisco router, this is what's going to happen. You can have this coding over here that gives you an idea about C means connected, S means static, R means RIP, O means OSPF, you get the idea. And those letter codes help us with knowing, oh, okay, that's how that route there was learnt. It's a directly connected. D is for EIGRP. Okay, that's how that route was learnt. O is for OSPF. Fantastic. Then we have our information set over here, and Cisco calls it a gateway of last resort, but this is called a default route. It's like a default gateway, but I'll explain it a little bit more later in this video. Then we have specific destination networks. We've got a couple 172.16 networks, all sitting with a slash 24, and it says there it's directly connected, and that's the interface. Lovely. Then we have an EIGRP route, 192.168.25.0 with a 30-bit mask. The square brackets that says 90, that is the administrative distance. That is the cost value. Don't worry, that's normal for EIGRP. And it was learned via this interface. So it tells you, okay, you heard it from this neighbor, so that's going to be the next top IP address. And there's the interface you are sending it out of on the current router. Similar story here for OSPF. There's a 192.168.1.0 slash 24 network. We've got a 110 administrative distance, as Cisco calls it. Cost of eight via that neighbor. So that's the next top IP address. And there's the exit interface. Lovely stuff. Let's go check out another example. This one is a Juniper routing table. And the way it works is it populates quite nicely with the network addresses over here. So let's say we've got a couple interesting ones. Let's go for the 192.168.127.0 slash 24 mask there. 
Then it says there square brackets, directly connected, preferences zero, interface you've got it on, and how long you've got that route going for. Lovely. Let's look at an OSPF route here. The 10116-31, learned it through OSPF, preference of 10, interface learned it on, lovely. And 210111, that's going to be the next top IP address via that interface. Fantastic. And for a third example, here is a routing table from Huawei. And Huawei makes it look more like a table. We've got the destination network addresses here and their masks. We've got the protocol that was used to learn it, although this is just static and direct here. There is the preference values Huawei uses, direct is zero, static is 60. I warned you, preference values might be very different. The cost columns are all zeros because they're all either static or directly connected. The flag bits, uh, just indicate that this router is using it. The D means downloaded to forwarding information base. In a later video, I will explain what a forwarding information base is. The next hop IP address or the next router's IP addresses are listed there. And the current appliances interfaces for sending the traffic out of are listed there. Technically, this screenshot comes from a layer 3 switch, which is why it's VLAN interfaces instead of things like gigabit Ethernet or something like that. And we will be doing VLANs at some point in a future video. Now, let's talk about static routing. Static routes are manually configured by network administrators, and they are quite nice because they don't need any resources to maintain them. Once configured, the router just follows the instructions without having to think twice. And they're great when the network is simple or stable or small. The downside, though, is that static routes cannot automatically adapt if the network changes. There are ways to set up backup static routes where if the main one fails, a second one takes over, but you're basically doubling up your effort because you are going to be going to every router and telling it with the command about every destination network it needs to route to and how to route it there. And this is the scary thing. You are doing it one at a time either through the command line or through a web console. And it's going to often boil down to being one command per destination and how to get the traffic to that destination on every router. So if I've got 30 networks to route to, I'm going to have to run 30 static routing commands on each and every one of my routers. So the workload does add up, which is why we normally encourage it either for simple, stable, or small networks, preferably all three. And the commands will vary by the vendor, but generally there's three key things that need to be put in there. The destination network address and subnet mask, the exit interface, and or the next top IP address. Shock and horror, the three key things that need to be in a routing table entry for that router to choose that route for path selection. Then we have something called a default route. Default routes are to routers what default gateways are to clients and servers. It's the IP address you send the traffic to if you don't have a better routing table entry to get traffic to a given destination. Now, default routes are used for the situation when the router doesn't have an entry that matches. Now, you might think that sounds a bit weird, but let me explain. What happens is, in an IP routing table, the default route will usually have a network address of 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. So the network address is all zeros, and the subnet mask is zero. And the way the router reads that is the network address is undefined. But when there's a routing table entry with a destination network of 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, the router will see that as its longest possible match because, well, it just means it's a valid IPv4 address, but nothing else matches better. And that route will be used if I don't know the destination. Now, in a home network or even a small business network, you're not going to have every destination network address in the world. That's what you're paying your ISP for. You are going to just have default routes for the networks that are outside of your organization or outside of your home network that will point to the ISP and the ISP will source out the rest of the routing because, well, that's what we're paying for. That and the speed of the connection. Now, when you want to set up a default route, you can either do it statically or you can do it via a dynamic routing protocol. Choice is entirely up to you. 
but both can be done at the same time. You can statically set up a default route and use dynamic routing for the rest of your network. Remember, the only time we care about the whole preference and the cost thing is if there are two or more ways to a given destination network. So then the preference would kick in and then cost would kick in and stuff like that and the better method of learning a route would be chosen even if that better method of learning a route is for a default route. Other way though, that is that for our introduction to routing. Although it might look simple right now, when you do get stuck into doing it, it can get quite tricky. But always remember to go back to basics. Three key things. Destination network, exit interface, next hop IP address. In the next video, we're going to look at dynamic routing protocols and how they help us out and how they make life a lot easier for larger, more complicated networks. And we'll also start to explore things like cost a little bit more in the next video. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed that. And I'd like to say thank you for watching. If you have any friends, family members, colleagues or peers that are also interested in Network Plus, don't be afraid to share this with them and don't forget to subscribe and drop a like. Otherwise though, I'm going to see you in the next video.